G'day folks and welcome to Gourmet's Shed and uh, this week we're looking at uh, train detection on hidden parts of your layer. Now I came up with this because I have this exact problem. Uh, trains that come in here to uh, Bamford have to actually come in through a room I've got behind this wall and I'll, I'll show you just how trains uh, exit and enter the room just here. So we'll, we'll just move the camera and I'll show you. Right, trains come from uh, around behind this hole through a uh, little barred field and they're down below uh, Bamford uh, area here. Uh, they're running along the wall, the back wall there, and they exit by that lower hole there. It's hard to get a good view of it, but uh, yeah, a train passes out through that hole on, let's say, the lower level, uh, does a loop of the back room, which I'll show you in a moment, comes back in to uh, Bamford through this hole here. Right, this is the room I'm talking about folks, the storage room out the back and uh, as you can see the uh, track comes across a bridge here and goes around the room. That's a six metre run around there and uh, what happens is trains uh, exit the room uh, down below Bamford at this lower level and uh, they do this uh, climb uh, which is uh, 1 in 70. Uh, you can see this uh, loco and coach is coming through now. Goes across the bridge and uh, climbs up and around. Now, obviously, whilst this train's doing this circuit in here, um, I have no idea what's going on uh, from the other room. So that's why we need the uh, detection in here of some form. And, uh, to uh, give me an idea of how the uh, train's progressing around the room. Uh, you know, because I have had uh, problems out here before where something might derail and uh, if you're looking at a mimic panel and watching the uh, LEDs flashing on and off and then there's, there's nothing happening, well that obviously tells you that there's something wrong out here. Uh, it also lets you know when the tra train's about to enter the room again or um, come in from the, the lower level so that's all very good. So I felt the ideal situation for me would be to have um, a mimic panel up here with a, a track plan on it of the back room and I could have LEDs spaced around it uh, to show whereabouts a loco is on that circuit in that room and uh, the, the problem then is how to activate the LEDs and how to keep it simple. Okay folks, what I've got here is I'm using one millimeter uh, galvanized wire that's been straightened and if you need to know how to straighten uh, wire effectively you should look at uh, episode 62 of Gourmet Shed some time back and that will give you a detailed uh, description of how to straighten wire effectively. So I've used one millimeter galvanized wire and this piece here is approximately 160 millimeters long and uh, I've drilled holes in between the sleepers at each end where there's a right angle bend in this bit of wire and the right angle bend drops down through the holes and it can move quite freely. It just flops around all over the joint. Now uh, over and above that the same wire has been bent into, same sort of wire has been bent into a, a U shape and uh, holes drilled, these um, holes are drilled about 10 millimeters apart and that goes over the top of this wire underneath and as you can see uh, I'm using it as a switch um, and uh, this has a couple of um, um, insulation uh, insulators on it I've uh, just got, found some suitable wire and stripped the insulation off and I've cut the insulators to 4 millimeters in length. I then place something um, flat over that and push it down so it's just at rail level. Not above rail level but it's at rail level. Mm -hmm. um, this uh, wire here sits on the sleepers and as, as I said it's allowed to move quite freely. And uh, what I've also done is um, put magnets under my locos. Now uh, a lot of you won't like the idea of magnets under locos uh, because there's a, a theory that it picks up lots of rubbish and all that sort of thing. Well 
I'm prepared to, to deal with that for the simplicity of this system. So the way it works is that um, there's a wire connection onto the, the U-shaped piece that crosses here and there's one wire off this piece of wire here and the two wires combined form the circuit to activate the LED obviously with the correct voltage and resistor going through it to, to activate it. And uh, what it means is that on this loco, uh, can you see that? Where are we? On this loco here, I have a magnet just there. Uh, this magnet is, uh, this is what I use for my magnetic undercoupling. It's uh, 10 millimeters long by 2 thick by 3 wide, I think it is, something like that. And um, as the magnet passes over the, the wire, it lifts the wire and it hits against the U-shaped wire to form the circuit and as the loco passes over it, it, it um, breaks the circuit again. But the thing with it is, as it's independent to the track, you can, and because the wire is a reasonable gauge, you can leave it sitting there probably all day and you're not going to affect the contacts between the wire. It's, it's sort of um, robust in that way. Now we'll just start the loco up and give it a bit of a test run. You can see there at that speed it's staying on for, I don't know, about two seconds. But even if the loco is travelling quicker, you get a reasonable amount of time there. And that will show up well on an indicator board. I'll show you another loco. This is an old Farish loco. And uh, again, it's just that that magnet is literally just holding there by its own uh, magnetism. Uh, it's uh, just stuck up under the chassis there. I didn't even have to glue that one on. Again, with your magnets, you've got to keep them above track level because if you're crossing points or, have, or anything like that they will scrape on the rail so it's important to um, remember those clearances now I'll show you what it's like underneath right the the wires that's laying on the sleepers is bent at a right angle goes down through the baseboard if you like and then underneath I use a spacer, in this case I've used my flat steel ruler and put it against the wire and then bent it over the ruler. That, that gives me a bit of play in, in, the, uh, in the movement there. It allows it to, to lift up a bit. You need a bit of play in it. And, uh, and of course at the other end uh, over here where I've done the same thing I've attached a wire to it and uh, I've used a very light wire here. Uh, if you've got any old um, computer leads, you know, what do they call them, VGA leads or whatever, if you strip the uh, insulation, the outer insulation off those cables, uh, you get some very light gauge uh, wires there which are good. You don't want anything too heavy so that um, the magnet can't pull the wire up. So it's just something very light and we're only dealing with currents going to LEDs. So, you know, it doesn't have to be anything fantastic. And uh, as I said, that U-shaped piece in the middle, uh, this one here, that's just pushed through and uh, holds something flat over the top of it and push down against the rail and then bend the ends over. And obviously we have to solder a wire to one of the ends as well to, to form the circuit. So that's all it is. Right, just to give you a better view of it uh, from the top, um, th this hole here is about three millimeters. Uh, you need stacks of room 
for this to move unobstructed. It's got to be able to flop around. Uh, there's the, the bridge again. We'll call it the bridge with the uh, wire insulation to insulate it. Um, I don't, with, with something that wide it's probably not that necessary to insulate it but they act as a spacer or as a buffer to, to keep pressure on this and stop it falling down any lower below the, uh, the rail level. You don't want this dropping down onto the, this wire so you need something to hold it up uh, so the insulation was, was just easy to do. Uh, just cut it with a sharp knife at uh, four millimeters and that's the other end there. Now normally this LED wouldn't be there. Now the reason I've um, put the, the saddle if you like or the bridge or whatever we shall call this thing we'll stick with bridge. The reason I've put that in the middle is that uh, when the magnet passes over this wire it gets to a point probably the midpoint uh, in between this and where the hole is where it starts to actually lift the wire and bend it slightly. Now if I had this bridge at one end uh, over this length of 160 millimeters um, the wire would actually probably lift up and touch the magnet so that's one thing that needs to be avoided. Uh, you don't want the magnet scraping on the wire so you need to reach a happy medium there and, I, and that's why I've, I've put it in the middle here because you get actually a seesaw effect you'll, you'll get one end lift and make contact and as it comes along it keeps contact on the, on the wire and then it lifts this side and does the same thing until it finally drops away this as I say is 160 millimeters long I reckon you could probably go 180 uh, maybe 200 millimeters in length um, don't know, haven't tested it over that length at this stage uh, and then of course you would have to look at the wire bending situation over that length I think it would probably be okay but um, yeah so uh, that's where I am at the moment, I'm with 160 uh, which seems to be good enough for my purposes and um, you know you can make up a, single, a simple jig to uh, cut to 160 long to make sure you always uh, bend at the same length uh, same applies to the bridge I just um, bend that around a piece of 10mm uh, um, aluminium flat bar so I can always bend it the same I use the flat bar laid on the track to um, drill my holes for this either side so I know they're 10 mils apart and same with um, well it's not so critical with the, the larger holes here but you know I can just lay the 160 mil length of flat bar along there and say oh yes I've got a I've got a drill there or I've got a drill there etc etc so fairly simple system folks so there we are a final look at it I'll zoom in a bit there for you actually looks like it's touching there but that's uh, the camera deceiving you there if it was touching the LED would be on so there we are okay folks uh, this really is old technology uh, in that it's uh, really an open reed switch however it's been modified to suit my needs um, that said, it's very simple. Uh, it will work with analog and it will work with DCC because it's totally independent to either system. It's not relying on any sort of currents passing through the rails or anything like that. It's totally independent and uh, it can even be used if you want uh, to uh, uh, fire off points uh, or possibly any other thing you want to trigger off. Now, if, you, if you're um, using it to set off points you would obviously make uh, the uh, the length of wire quite a lot shorter because you don't want a long pulse of power going into a solenoid uh, or use a reed switch uh, so there's uh, a few other options with it um, but uh, I think you know these LEDs I'm using I was given those uh, the wire is about seven bucks for 50 meters or something uh, yeah it costs nothing to knock one of these up so it's, we're talking cents a few cents so um, 
that's the attraction of it and uh, as I said before the simplicity of it uh, is good so uh, that's the way I'm going so if you can get any value out of it uh, do so by all means and uh, let me know how you go <laughs> so I'll see you next week cheers Gormo.